Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Um, today's lesson is going to be two lessons. Two lessons that are going to be exactly the same. Everybody knows the prodigal son. Everybody. So today we're going to talk about the prodigal son first, as the prodigal son would be presented to the um, worst of the worst on earth, uh, maybe a, a, a group of prisoners. Uh, second, we're going to present the prodigal son um, as uh, we would to school children, to grade school children. Same message, but a different audience, and uh, well worth, well worth repeating. Uh, first, let's define the word prodigal. Uh, prodigal is a noun. That uh, uh, defines someone that spends money reckless, recklessly in an incredibly extravagant manner. As an adjective, as an adjective, prodigal means and describes someone giving lavishly on a lavish scale. So two completely different meanings. We know much about God, but do we know him? What is he like? What are his interests? What does he think? Today I would like to study his reaction to our sinful condition. Jesus used parables to give us insight into his father's personality. We learn about the father's feelings in regard to our sinfulness in one parable, that of the prodigal son. The parable could be called the forgiving father. As we listen to the parable, let's dwell on the father's mercy rather than the son's misery. Luke 15, verses 11 through 16. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So that he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. It is typical of the human condition to be completely self-centered. We have done what the youngest son has done so many times and in so many ways. For example, the more self-centered we become, the more miserable we are. Wanting to eat the pods that were being fed to pigs was about as low as you could go on the, Jew on the Jewish totem pole. Uh, by our own self-centeredness, we also cut ourselves off from all of our friends and all of our family. Verses 17 through 20. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. Sometimes God allows us to fail, to bring us to our senses. We regret that, but the good news is that we don't need to be stuck in past failures. We need to learn from our mistakes, and God is teaching us always through our mistakes. The first step on the road back, it's not easy. We have to be willing to admit that we blew it. We have to remember that the difficulty arose because we forgot the mercy of the parent 
and the depth and the strength of the parent's love. The moment we decide, I will leave this place, the condition or the situation that we are in, and go to my father, he receives us back. He receives us back because he never left. We do. He is always there waiting for us to come back. Verses 21 through 24. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. God always waits for our return because he is always there. He never left. God is always ready to forgive because he has already forgiven. And he is always there to put his arm around us, to kiss us. God rejoices in our return. And they began to celebrate because they were back. Verses 25 through 30. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field when he came near the house. He heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back and he is safe and sound. So the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and he pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look. All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours who has squandered your pro property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. To demonstrate the greatness of our Father's mercy, Jesus shows us the contrast of the usual human reaction to a sinner. The older son represents those who we call good. He reacts the way many good human beings react and refuses to forgive. He is jealous, he is bitter, and he is really upset about his father's mercy to his little brother. It is evident that the devotion to his father has been motivated somewhat by self-interest. Because he is self-centered, he cannot forgive, he cannot forget, he cannot forget the sin of his younger brother. He even disowns his little brother when he says to his father, this son of yours. He doesn't even call him his brother. Verses 31-32. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and now he is found. Our Father is waiting for the first sign for us that we are ready and want to return because he is standing there waiting for us. He, he wants us to be fully members of his family. He wants us to make our return, and he wants to make that return easy. He comes to meet us. He wants to rid us of the burden of sin. He wants to share in the uh, unending celebration and peace and joy. We all must be willing to return. I will leave this place, the condition or the situation that we are in, and I will return to my Father who is waiting. That would appeal to a little older audience uh, than the next presentation of the scripture. Um, Mike and I 
Mike, Mike Stefke and I have the, the privilege. Mike, every Tuesday, he comes in and he does chapel for the Pine Grove Christian Academy. I uh, deliver the message oh, once, once or twice a month. Um, it is uh, an incredible experience. Uh, these young people are uh, so schooled in uh, the right way to live. They are very disciplined. Uh, that boy, do they know the Bible. Uh, God help you if you make a Bible mistake in front of them. Nine hands go up in the air, and I can tell you it's happened to me a couple of times. Not that I don't know everything that's in there. Um, but they're a different audience. They're a different audience. So I take a little bit of liberty with, uh, with the parable. We'll do it in the first person. I knew it wasn't going to work out. But my son was so insistent. He said he was just sick and tired of working in the family business that he just wanted out. He said he was missing out on most of what the world had to offer and he wasn't going to miss out on what was out there. Well, I knew what was waiting for him out there. But he had stopped listening to me. He had stopped listening to my advice a long time ago. He wanted his share of the family business and nothing was going to stop him. I told my wife that I decided to give him the money. She had a fit. She said, once he gets out into the world, he's never going to come back. I told her that we had done all we could and that we had instilled goodness in him. And while that goodness might not be visible right now, it was just under the surface. And, and, and then it would come up again. And, and, and we have to let him go. My oldest son seemed content just to watch him get out of the house. Well, the day he left was so sad. Uh, the tears of my wife, the breaking of my heart, the pain that I felt, the, the absolute disregard that my oldest son had for the whole situation. Um, it just filled the whole house with pain. If only he knew how much I loved him. If only he knew how much I would miss him. You know, he was gone. And I know a lot of people uh, in a lot of places. And he went off to a, a long way away. But I know people that were in that country. And I got word back every once in a while that he was not doing very well. I wondered when he was not doing well if he knew that I was thinking about him. I wondered if he knew how much I loved him. I wondered how much I wanted him to come back to me. Did he understand that? I wanted to know if he maybe understood how many hours I sat on that front porch waiting for him to come home, just to see him making his way down our street one more time. Well, one evening as the sun was getting ready to set, I saw someone walking down the street way in the distance, and boy, oh boy, I thought, was, is, my, is my wait over? Huh? Was it him? Could it be? I couldn't contain myself. I started running, even though he was a long ways away, to that speck that was coming over the hill. With every step, my hope, my heart soared that it would be my son coming home. For a moment, when I got close, I thought it wasn't him. You see, my son was always well-dressed. He was always well-groomed. And, 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 and this person that I was coming upon was dressed in rags. He had no shoes. His hair was long and soiled. And he was walking with his head down. My, my youngest son always walked with his, with his head up with a, with a confident stride. But this person walked, walked like he uh, like he wanted to get somewhere, but he didn't want to have anybody notice him getting there and didn't want to have anybody notice him when he got there. He was still a little ways off, and I yelled as loud as I could, Son! Son! And he stopped. And he looked at me 
with tears rolling down his face, and he whispered to me, Dad, I am so sorry. I hugged him. I took him back to the house. We get him clean clothes. We got him a bath before we got the clean clothes. We got him a haircut. We got him a shave. Um, got him new shoes, nice sandals, bird stalkers, I think. Um, and I noticed that his ring was missing. See, he and I had graduated from the same college, and we had the same college ring. Mine was 25 years uh, ahead of his, but just the date was different, and his ring was gone. I could only imagine what it would have happened, how we would have parted with it, but I took that, my ring off my finger, and, and I gave him my ring. He kept apologizing, and finally I told him that he never had to ask for my forgiveness again. As far as I was concerned, this matter was closed. I told him the important thing was to celebrate his return, and the party is in the works so that everybody knows that you're back. My wife was just absolutely thrilled to see our household coming back together again. My older son was not happy at all. He didn't show up at the party. I found him the next day and he was still very angry. Um, and he thought that because I welcomed my son home, that it was a sign that I didn't love him as much as I loved his brother. I explained to him that my love for him and his brother was exactly the same as it was before his brother left, while he was gone, and after they came back. But this was a very difficult thing for him to understand. I told him that physically leaving like his brother did was no different than spiritually leaving the house, as he was doing. Um, his anger at his brother's turn, at his brother's return, was a, another separation of our family. I held him in my arms and I told him, you've been working very hard. Take a couple of days off and think about this. He needed to relax. He needed to think about the family. A few days later, I saw my two sons talking and smiling. My youngest son was lost and now he was found. My oldest son was hurt and now he was healed. My family is now happy and at peace. Now, I took a little bit of liberty with the end of that, as you can probably tell. However, I will tell you this, and Mike can back me up on this. It's very important when you're talking to children that they all lived happily ever after. So guess what? They all lived happily ever after. Let's bring this up to journey. Let's take this up and Look at how this relates to us. There's no secret here. We are a Galatians 2.20 church. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself to me. So how does this get to the prodigal son? In Matthew 28, verses... 19 and 20, Jesus says to his disciples, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Today, most of us here realize that that commandment to go in and make disciples of all nations uh, was a directive also to us. 3,000 years ago, it was to his trusted 12. Now, it's to millions of Christians throughout the world. Um, so, how do we teach this? You know, not everybody is a Sunday school teacher. Not everybody leads a Bible study. Not everybody is a preacher. So, how do we teach that? It's very simple. We become the Lord's arms and legs in this world when he lives in us. 
Your example of obeying everything he commands teaches all of those that you touch every day by example. The prodigal father was doing nothing more than letting the love of the Lord flow through him in teaching not only his son, but all of the people that worked in the business, all of the people in the community, all, everybody that witnessed his love, his generosity, his forgiveness, and his obeying everything Jesus commanded was teaching the world. The lesson today is really very simple. We are the arms and we are the legs of the Lord in this world. Every time you show the fruits of the Spirit, oh, another wonderful Galatians scripture. Every time you show the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control to your son, to your family, to your co-workers, to strangers. You are teaching in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There is no better example of this anywhere in the Bible, in my opinion, than the prodigal father. Amen. When the musicians come up to play, if there are those of you that have lots on your, lots on your minds, I will be up front and uh, I will be, uh, be glad to pray with, with anybody that would like to come up. So some of you might not know about Scott Waterman as he comes up here. And um, Scott has been through a lot with, uh, with his leg and his foot. And uh, he's now a bionic man. He's got a new foot. Don't hurry, Scotty. It's okay. See, it's like we're a family here. And even uh, when one hurts, we all hurt. And then when one rejoices, we all rejoice. Uh,